Good morning, St Andrews. And a very good morning to those who are watching, live streaming, uh, very welcome to the service, or perhaps a little later in the day or this week you'll be watching. It's great that you're joining us as well. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west and north and south. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we come here this morning, we thank you that you have redeemed us from our enemies and that we can come here today with a heart set on you. And so, Lord, we pray now as we worship you, as we hear your word, as we pray, that you would presence yourself in our hearts and that your name would truly be hallowed in our midst today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And please be upstanding for our first hymn, which is going to be, It Is Well With Our Soul. When he 
Thanks, Jason. And we're going to further our worship with the next song, Glorify. Please be upstanding.
Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns and grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So consider the path of the rocky ground and the thorny ground. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that the good news of salvation is freely offered to all people and is preached here and in thousands of other churches throughout the world. Today, Lord, we pray for all the people who have heard this message, even in the most fleeting way. Lord, will you warm their hearts towards you and give them a hunger to seek you. We know that those who seek you will find you. Today, Lord, I'm also thinking of all those babies who were baptised here in St Andrews. Their parents brought them before you, and in the presence of the congregation, they were dedicated to you. Promises were made to bring these children up in the knowledge of you. Lord, only you know where all of those dear ones are, are now and what form their upbringing took. We pray that you will strengthen the ones who have grown up to know you and follow you. And for the rest, we ask that you will continue to set them out, like the shepherd who leaves the 99 to search for the one that is lost. And we also pray for anyone who, as a child, heard about God's love for them, perhaps a Bible school teacher, a Sunday school teacher presented your story in such a powerful way that the memory of it remains with them even after many years, or the memory of a worship song or a hymn Saying so school assembly comes frequently to mind. We pray that these things will warm their hearts towards you. Please bring them into contact with Christians and into a strong relationship with you. As the Lord and Saviour, with the faith of a little child, becoming a strong follower of Christ. Today, Lord, we pray for anyone who has deliberately walked away from fellowship with you from fellowship with your Christian brothers and sisters, the rebels, the stubborn ones, the prodigals, those who have allowed their hearts to be hardened and have shut their ears to your voice and chosen to go their own way. Lord Jesus, your word tells us in Luke 19 that you came to seek and save those who are lost. And in 2 Peter chapter 3 it says, God is being patient because he does not want any to be lost, but wants all to come to repentance. Only you can do this, Lord. And today, Lord, we also pray for anyone who has allowed themselves to be distracted by other things. The busyness of life, the worries and daily concerns that have crowded out the delicate ceiling. And those who have been discouraged, hurt, offended, betrayed, or abandoned by the church or by a fellow Christian who has said too much or said too little. And because of this, they've stopped coming to church and let their love for you grow cold. Psalm 147, verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Lord, will you do this? And if we need to reach out to someone in particular, please prompt us to do this without delay. Finally, Lord, help us all to put down strong roots into good soil, to be nourished by your Holy Spirit, to be fruitful, to be salt and light in our community. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Thank you that you've given us everything we need to walk with you. We ask all these things in the precious name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Before Jim brings our reading of the word, we're going to hear the next song, Jesus Take Me As I Am. Please get us in. Jesus, save me. 
Please be seated. This morning's reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 11, page 886 in the Pew Bible. From duty to devotion. Wrong one there. It's, there is another one up here. That's last week's. I think it's there. Had to have one this morning. Maybe I left him with house stick and put on the Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Amen. This St Andrews is God's word. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we come to this passage this morning, I ask and we ask that it would be you that would speak, not me. So come, here we pray and have your way, in Jesus' name. Amen. About a year ago, uh, a person was uh, from the Gloraville community. They were just here for a season. And uh, I, was just, I was actually met them at the um, uh, Restawile Ministry, and they said, I think I finally get it with you and Jason and Sunday morning messages. I said, get it? He said, yeah, you just teach the Bible. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and she said that um, when in the context she was originally, there was a, uh, there's often, they, they taught the Bible, there's often hidden agendas. Uh, I, I imagine to do with power and control and, and just stuff to the politics going on. But she said, I've worked it out. You're just teaching the next text of the Bible. I was like, yeah, we just work your way through a book of the Bible. So there's generally speaking, no hidden agenda. Uh, and uh, that was my recollection of the conversation. Well, today is different. There is an agenda. <laughs> and, so, uh, and if there is an agenda, I think it should be noted up front, so it's not a hidden agenda. The St. Andrew's session um, said to me, Alistair, we need a sermon on giving. These are the elders of the finance team. They looked at me, hint, hint, like you're going to give the message on, mm. on, on giving. So, uh, and so I was like, okay, uh, I'm not Chad Tozer who now heads the finance team, but I'll, I'll let him as convenience for the details. But basically, while we're not doing absolutely terribly on the income front, I think it would make Chad's and the finance teams a lot easier if our giving went up. So they wanted me to give the message, which is fair enough. So there you go, St. Andrews, there's the agenda. Just put it out there. Uh, um, I don't sort of believe in sort of hidden stuff. So just a few disclaimers. If you aren't a Christian and you just happen to turn up as a spiritual seeker, I can just imagine a spiritual seeker turning up, grumbling, oh, the churches are always just after money. Then turn up to St. Andrews today and be like, no. So let me just say this. We aren't after your money. You know, God's not after your heart. So please don't give today. Or <laughs> really the obligation to give. Um, just break your chicken us out out today. And next, uh, this will be particularly applicable maybe for second service, but you may be one or two here as well. If you're married to a non-Christian and in our second service we're blessed with some people who are, are just come to Christ and de facto relationships with non-Christian partners working on the marriage thing, please don't mention church and money in the same breath. Uh, or sentence to your non-believing husband or wife, particularly if you're not the breadwinner. There's no pressure for you to give anything. 
and certainly not put a stumbling block in someone's way. You know, how to stop your spouse giving their life to Christ? One easy sentence. Money and church. Just put them together. Uh, and then, next one. Uh, if you're visiting, all right, there may be some of you visiting. We often have a few or tuning in online uh, this morning. Give to your home church. We don't want your money. Give to your support, the one that you, that you are. It's just great you're here. Be generous. This, this message encourages generosity. We just want you to support your home church. Uh, next, if you've experienced spiritual abuse in the area of giving from past churches, I am really sorry about that. I am really hoping this message will be a bit better. Uh, that's my hope. Uh, and lastly, um, giving is to the Lord isn't just about giving to the local church. It's part of it. But I support missionaries, tear fund child. There is much, much more to Christ's kingdom than St. Andrews. Praise God for that. <laughs> There's so much happening. God's doing an awful lot of the world. Yes, I'm sure it would make our finance team's life a lot easier if, you, if you're generous to us and skimp everywhere else. But that's not difficult. So uh, the holistically, spirit-directed giving is the way. But if it worked out on the providence of God, that your generous spirit worked out in St. Andrews, then I'm sure that would make the finance team a little bit's life a little easier. So there you go. So there's, uh, there's uh, a, a group of disclaimers, just worth throwing them in. And now I want to have a look at this. How not to give. For space for the text. We're just going to look at this little text on giving and just unpack it and see what it means today. And see that there is a way of not giving. You can give in a bad way. Then we look at how to give. And then we're going to look at the result of giving. Alright, so first, how not to give. So do you know that you can give outwardly in a seemingly generous fashion, but it doesn't please God? That we could have this church overflowing in money, the finance team saying, Hey, what an awesome message, Alistair! But the Holy Spirit is grieved in the process. Now, Jesus gives some ways that that can happen, which is giving publicly, right? So he mentions those that give publicly have already received their reward. But here in the text that we're just looking at, one way is under compulsion. Right, so here's external force, which could be blunt and direct. So just imagine someone like me, standing up in front of you, giving a sermon on giving. Watch it, right? What are they saying? Uh, is there a sort of a, a compulsion you must give? Right? If there's that compulsion, and sometimes there can be the sort of mixed messages. You know, oh, it's between you and God, you know, but... <laughs> you know, it's these sort of mixed messages, you know, and it's... it's it's uh, emotional manipulation. Could be some worship songs, just getting the tune, a, 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 a preacher that's out there just putting the heart strings, uh, these things. And sometimes in some particular cultures, there's a shame and honor element. I had a Pacific Island friend who said tragically in the church he grew up in, the amount of money that was given was announced every Sunday, you know, the Pacific Island families. And there was shame and honor given on in my view, right, there's probably stuff that we do here at St. Andrews that isn't biblical, so I'm not trying to knock the Pacific Island Church, because no church has got it all together. Certainly, I don't have it all together, but may I suggest that that is not biblical, to do shame and honour in that way uh, of it. I think it's a form of compulsion. So there's a fine line here for me. If the Holy Spirit convicts you this morning, that's great. If he uses me to do that, I'm okay with that. But, I don't know, if it actually a sense of me doing that, or the church that does that, that comes under compulsion, it's actually wrong. The next is reluctantly. So there's the external pressure, but this is about internal pain, where you don't want to give. You hate giving. It creates pain in your heart. Right, so I just remember the time that I went online to pay a car fine, uh, and to put a speeding fine, and it was grieving me to put the money into the consolidated account for our Prime Minister. I was not a happy person putting the money from one account into the other, seeing it by. It was a grief in my heart, because I sort of like having, keeping my money and not giving it to the government. Right, so if giving is like that, that is a problem, all right? So uh, anytime we do it reluctantly. So let me give us an analogy of that. The scriptures give an image of the church being the bride of Christ. Are you aware of that? There's an image of us being the bride of Christ. It's, it's a pretty well-known image in scripture. So just imagine a couple being married, and as I'm a man, I'll give the perspective of the husband as an example. Just imagine, he's getting about to get married, and he's reading what, what are the duties of a husband. So he goes through and reads the Old Testament, 
And he finds out that, well, I'm supposed to feed my wife and look after her. And we've got little children in the room, so I'll use the old-fashioned word in, in conjugal. I think that's the term, conjugal rights. These are the things, right. So he turns up, and then uh, it's duty and not devotion is the watchwords. And of course, he sees that also in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 7 and Ephesians 5. So for the next 75 years, he does the bare minimum, based out of duty to the day they die. Duty, minimal, reluctance, cold-hearted, under compulsion from the Word of God. Imagine what that marriage would be like. It would be a pretty cold, and would, I imagine, create a, a, a starved, barren, loveless marriage that would grieve the wife and create untold emotional pain. And of course, vice versa, if a wife did that to a husband. Now here's the punchline, because I'm not talking about marriages, I'm talking about us being the bride of Christ. If we give to the Lord, whether in time, finance, whether it's singing, in any way, out of compulsion or reluctance, give the bare minimum, it will grieve the Holy Spirit because we are the bride of Christ. And he, the Lord is after our devotion, not our duty. When we desire to live holy and pure lives before Him, given generously because we love the Lord, and because God's love has changed our hearts. And we desire to please Him. And so it's this desire, this changed heart of devotion, not compulsion, not reluctance. All right, that, is the, that starts to get to the heart of it. So if are the wrong ways to give them under compulsion or reluctantly, then what is the right way to give? Well, the text here, I'm just unpacking it here in front of you. It's first got to be from your heart. This is a matter of the heart. So I'm, I'm actually a bit of a miser, I have to say. I love seeing my finances go up. Since I'm now, I can't manage finances. Now I'm managing finances. I'm saying, man, I'm managing finances better than way my wife managed. I'm getting finances going up. And it's, it's been quite cool in that sort of sense. So I'm a miser. So I might say something along the lines of, Lord, you know I'm a miser. But Lord, I want to have my heart overflow in love for you. I want my giving to come from my heart, not from external force, compulsion, and not reluctantly. Lord Jesus, let the affections of my heart be changed by your Holy Spirit. Duty is easy. Just do it. Love, a soft and generous heart. This is the issue. God requires us to have a change of heart. So God wants you to prayerfully decide uh, to give, whether it's uh, you know, in the original context there in, in, in Corinthians, it was the offering to Jerusalem about the poor. Right? So that was the original context there. But whether it was that context there, or whether it's given to a missionary overseas, nothing to do with St. Andrews, or whether it's of your time, you're thinking of giving time to a mission, or whether it is indeed the offering to St. Andrews, this is a thing of prayerfully discerning in your heart what the Lord is deciding you to give. All right? So, and, and, and this stuff of the heart is, it's, it's the difference between, I gave the speeding fine example, that's under compulsion or reluctance, when you give, it should be a bit more like, uh, imagine a man buying an engagement ring, right? He's giving from his heart, he's choosing the engagement ring. I've met very few fiancés who are like, oh, it's going to cost me a thousand dollars to get this ring. <laughs> Generally speaking, though, there's a sense of enthusiasm about the forthcoming marriage and things like that. It's from the heart, and there's a sense of, dis of, of, of uh, love and overflow that comes from it, and that leads to cheerful giving, right? A sense of joy at doing that. And, of course, I have said this... Um, my, uh, my son, Daniel, after he heard this analogy I gave many years ago, said, oh, I'm never getting married, I'm losing my money. That's what Daniel said to me, he heard the, the message. But when I first started dating Catherine, I just loved her so much. I just had, I had saved all this money up, and within, I think it was six months, I basically bankrupted all my financial reserves. <laughs> I'm taking her out and doing this and that. Why? Because I was a cheerful giver. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and uh, the miserliness had gone. Right, so there's a sense, but it, there wasn't a sense of, I didn't, I was, I was in love, right? And there's a sense and that should be the case within a Christian. And that, of course, will lead uh, uh, to a sense of je spirit-given generosity. Now, this is just a handy thing. Uh, in the Old Testament, it talks about 10% giving. There is no command to the New Testament, in the New Testament letters to the New Testament church for you to give 10%. You just need to know that. Now, Jesus does mention tithing in the Gospels, but it's in that Jewish context, and he talks about the more weightier matters of the Lord is not tithing. 
So, that's, so you do not have to give 10% to a local church. If you've come from that faith tradition, find me a text that tells me that in the New Testament letters. You will not find it. However, you all think, oh, my demise is here, including me. Go, I'm off the hook, right? This is the duty of devotion. I don't want to do it. Well, let me just say this. If you're giving out of generosity, not duty, would you give more or less? When you have a heart that's moved, would you give more or less than what duty commands? Now, I'm not telling you to give 10% or less or more. It's, it's from the heart, not from compulsion, and not reluctantly. So I can't go any further than that. But you should have a look at the heart and say, Lord, where's my heart at this morning? All right, and so what is the result of this? Well, the result is the, and to enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Jesus puts this out. Store up treasure in heaven. heaven. Well done. Not on earth. Right, he says this again and again and again. Right, you receive eternal rewards. All right, this is the key. All right, and so this is, don't, and Jesus also says, don't even to get those eternal rewards, don't even tell your left hand what your right hand is giving. So this is not something to announce to St. Andrews. Right, and then the next result of it will be a thanksgiving to God. So when you give, so in the original context there, as they were giving uh, to, the, to the poor Christians in Jerusalem, those Christians there would have been given thanksgiving to God. And so when you give from the Spirit giving, it will result in praise being given to the Lord. And this is a good thing. Now, before I became a Christian, I would have thought, well, two. so if I give, the two things I'm going to get is reward in heaven and some, and some thanks to God. I'll be like, is that it? But when you actually give your life to Christ to see the Lord's name honored, this becomes a driving factor for your life. And to build treasure in heaven, these things matter. These things matter. But there's also a sense that you become enriched. There is a generous return, and so you are enriched, and so you can't, can give. I'm not, I'm not a prosperity gospel person, but I, so I imagine a lot of that sense of us being enriched in every way is not necessarily financially, but it may also include that as well. Uh, Catherine and I, when we were very, very young Christians, we weren't even married at the time, and we were really skint on money. And Catherine, you know, you're young, you do crazy things. And Catherine said to me, why don't we give like, all that money to church to see what God does? Right? And I was like, no. I was like, I wanted to say no, because um, I, I was, um, but maybe I was under compulsion. <laughs> or reluctantly. Anyway, I went along with it. Right? And so I thought, let's give it a shot. Well, during, during the next few weeks, I'm not saying it was from God, but this is what happened. We got flooded with work. Just so much work. Right, that came our way. I had to work for the money, but it was a massive change, and I and I, and I do remember it. And Catherine said, "Look, this is what's happened," and and no one else knew. We just we just too, you know, and, and the amount of money we gave would have been about sixty or seventy dollars. It wasn't a lot, right? We had our, we were very young and not a lot there, but there was a sense that I saw the Lord's provision came through, and of course that provision meant that we could give more. Right? It was, and, and it was from, I saw that, and it, was, and it was quite exciting seeing the Lord answer that. So a generous, overflowing heart that loves God will just want to give. It's, it's a generosity, not under compulsion, not reluctantly. And this, what, what this does is it actually confirms, it doesn't save us doing this, but it confirms we have the Holy Spirit in us when we have this sort of heart. A cheerful giver, generous, spirit-directed from the heart, not from the pulpit, right? And not just to St. Andrew's Church, but in whatever way the Holy Spirit directs. This stuff that moves in our heart confirms the work of the Holy Spirit within us, right? So there are those that give sparingly and grudgingly. They see God as a taker. They reject the belief that God supplies our needs. They give out a duty. They will reap sparingly. They are like a bride of Christ in a marriage of cold duty. They grieve God and they miss out on so much. But for a person whose heart has been touched, not by an emotional manipulation from a minister, Lord may I have not have done that this morning, uh, but by the spirit of the living God, they are at a heart level, they love God. They're like a groom buying the engagement ring, sorry to use an analogy again, but it's cheerfully overflowing with joy as they look forward to a life together. So we are the bride of Christ, he wants our hearts, not our lots. Our devotion, not our duty. Though like in marriage, we do have duties under God to fulfill to God. 
but it's to be done in generosity, joy, cheerfully overflowing from a heart that loves our Lord, not under compulsion and not reluctantly. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, I, I do pray that, Lord, you would move our hearts in whatever way pleases you. And that, Lord God, that uh, we would honour you, Lord, and that, Lord, you know that uh, for me speaking on this text is challenging. Uh, it's perhaps one of the only messages I'm giving I've done, done in 20 years. But I pray simply this, that your spirit would be the doing the work in our hearts. And that what we do would come from a heart of love and a heart that has been impacted by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.